Dear Heavenly Father, thank you that you have gathered each one of us here on this Sabbath day to study thy word. As we proceed, we ask for the Holy Spirit's guidance that you give us spiritual understanding that we may be able to hear and to understand and receive the fresh truth straight from heaven. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now I'm going to begin with a little quiz. Just to make sure you're all wide awake. I'm going to give you a, um, ask you a question. It's a very simple one, true or false. Now don't look at each other. Just look at me when you hear the question. Just raise your hand, okay? The question is, in Bible prophecy, the United States of America is described as a lamb-like beast. I'm going to repeat again. In Bible prophecy, the United States of America is described as a lamb-like beast. How many of you say it's true? Raise your hand. How many of you say it's false? Raise your hand. How many of you don't know? Okay. <laughs> well, we want to find the answer from the Bible. And most of you said it's, it's true, right? Let's turn our Bibles to the book of Revelation, chapter 13. And verse 11. Revelation chapter 13, verse 11. The Bible says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. Now, does the Bible say the beast was lamb-like? What did we just read? This beast has two horns like a lamb. Do you see the difference? The beast itself is not like a lamb, but the two horns are like a lamb. Now there's a big difference because the significance is in those two horns. Two horns. Now, in Bible prophecy, horns represent authority or power. So this United States is a beast, but the two horns are like a lamb. Now what do those two horns represent? According to the Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, page 277, those two horns re represent republicanism, and Protestantism. In other words, one is a civil power, the other one is a religious power. And to understand the Sunday law, we have to kind of understand this beast with two horns like a lamb. And I'm going to give you a reference book, Great Controversy, pages 441 through 445. You need to go home and read those pages over again. Great Controversy 441 through 445. Here I'm going to just highlight some of the things that uh, is uh, noted here on those pages. Okay, I'm going to just highlight one of the things that is written here in this uh, book, Great Controversy, the word lamb-like symbolizes youth, innocence, and gentleness. That's why two horns are like a lamb. Represents youth, innocence, and gentleness. And she also says that republicanism and protestantism, those two horns, the two powers, these are the fundamental principles of the United States of America. And these principles is the secret of power and prosperity of our nation, United States. 
Now, we just read from Revelation 13, verse 11. The last part says, and he spake as a dragon. The speaking of the nation, what does that mean? The speaking of the nation. It means the action of its legislative and judicial authorities. Now, legislative branch, what is that in our government? It's the Congress, right? The Congress. They make laws. What about the judicial branch? The Supreme Court and all the other lower courts. And their function is to interpret the laws. Okay, so the speaking of a nation represents the action of Congress and how the courts interpret those laws that the Congress make. And that's the speaking of a nation. So to put it kind of together, the profession is like a lamb. It's pure, gentle, harmless, like Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. They're going to sound very Christian, but in practice, it's going to speak like a dragon. In other words, they're going to make and interpret law with the spirit of Satan, the great dragon. Okay? In other words, according to the Greek controversy, those same pages, she says that the United States is going to manifest the spirit of intolerance and persecution. Just like the first beast, we know which first beast represents. It's the papacy. The papacy during the dark ages persecuted and oppressed God's people. In other words, the United States of America someday is going to make and enforce Sunday worship, which we know to be the mark of the beast. And when those two powers, remember the two horns like a lamb, Protestantism and Republicanism? When the Protestant churches of America unite with the government of the United States and they make and enforce the Sunday law, that's when the image of the beast will be formed. That's when the image of the beast will be formed. Now, we always talk about the Sunday law in Adventism. I know many, many years ago when I came into um, Adventist church, I heard about the Sunday law, but it was a very vague idea. Oh, someday there's going to be a Sunday law. Oh, there's going to be a Sunday law. And then Jesus will come. Yeah, very general and vague. And personally, it was something that I, I dreaded. I kind of was kind of afraid of the Sunday law. Now, in Adventism, there seem to be two extremes. On one side, I know a friend told me there are pastors who teach that, don't worry, there will be no Sunday law. That's one extreme. Don't worry about it. On the other hand, we have the radical group saying, oh, the Sunday law is coming this year or next year. Then they get all hyped up. And in between those two extremes, there are, there are many um, teachings, and many of them are, seem to be like misconceptions, misunderstanding of what the Sunday law is really about, what the test is really about. And it's important to understand the Sunday law because the correct understanding of Sunday law is going to lead to a better understanding of other events that would take place. The significance, the timing and sequence of other events such as the latter rain, the loud cry. What about the judgment of the living? When does that take place? What about the seal of God? Or the close of provision? Or the blotting out of sin? What about character perfection? When will that take place? 
and of course 144,000. There are so many different interpretations. But we know there's only one truth. So what we're going to do this year is going to, um, we're going to study each theme from the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. So we have a better understanding of what is coming. Not only for ourselves, so that we can share that with others. Remember the disciples 2,000 years ago? They were confused about the prophetic events of his first coming. And because of that, they were bitterly disappointed. Even Judas, he lost his faith. He killed himself. Now, we don't want to go through what they did. We want to have what is revealed in the Word of God. We want to understand what is true so we will be ready for what is coming. Now, basically, I summarize, uh, there are about four misconceptions. There may be others, but I chose four of them. And we want to go through each one to make sure we understand what is truth. Now, the first one, I'm just going to uh, make a list of them first. And then later, we want to um, talk about each one. The first misconception that I know myself is that the Sunday law test is mainly for people outside Adventism. Because after all, we know which day is the true Sabbath. Okay, that's one misconception. The second one, there's an impression that the Sunday law is a brief one-time event. Boom, it comes, and then boom, 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 and then Jesus is going to come. One-time event. And I hear this a lot, and because of this misconception, it leads to other misunderstanding. And that's what the third one is about. I often hear this phrase, at Sunday law, or as soon as Sunday law is enacted, provision closes for all Seventh-day Adventists. I hear that a lot. And the fourth misconception is, at Sunday law, all Seventh-day Adventists are sealed in their foreheads. And a lot of these misconceptions have crept in into our church from other offshoot movements, such as Reformed Seventh-day Adventist Church or the Shepherd's Rod. So we're going to go through each misconception one by one. But the biggest concern that I have personally in the church is the spirit of indifference. People are not even interested in studying or reading or learning about the last day events. Oh, well, when it comes, God will help us. Don't worry about it. And just they go on to do, you know, other studies. That's my biggest concern. See. If you look at the Bible, in the first book, in the book of Genesis, there was a test, a first test for mankind. And that was, are you going to obey or disobey God's command, wasn't it? Are you going to eat or not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? That was the first test. In the last book of the Bible, in the book of Revelation, we just read the real test, the last test for mankind. And again, it will be, are we going to obey or disobey God's command? It's the same test. And we want to be focusing on this commandment, fourth commandment. Why? Because God is identified as the creator, the true God as a creator. And that's the object of special attack by Satan. <coughs> Satan has been trying to take away the Sabbath truth from the minds of the people because when he is successful, then people are going to forget about the true God. When you forget the Sabbath, we forget God. And Satan has been trying so that he himself will be worshipped. As God. That's what his motive is, his purpose. And so why God has to have this last test?
for mankind before Jesus comes? Because God has to divide all the people who are alive on this earth into two groups. Either we're going to be commandment keepers or commandment breakers. Only two groups. No, there is no third option. Because Jesus said, I come quickly. My reward is with me to give every man according to his work shall be. From Revelation 22 verse 12. What is the reward that Jesus is going to bring with him? Either eternal life or eternal death. Again, only two options. And we choose our own destiny. Because God is love, love can never force us to make any decision. So who receives which reward? That has to be decided before he actually comes, right? That's why God has to really do this test to make sure there are two groups. He doesn't want any commandment breakers in heaven. No, we can't start the great controversy over over again in heaven. No, not this time. So he has to make sure. That's why we have this last test. Now, the first misconception is that the Sunday law test is mainly for people outside of Adventism. I'm going to give you a reference. The Prophets and Kings, 188. PK 188. Here in the context, she's talking about the closing work of God in the last days. And then she makes this statement. The time is not far distant when the test will come to every soul. She didn't say it's going to come to the people out in the world. She said every soul. So the answer is no. The Sunday, law, the Sunday law test is for every single person living on this earth, including God's people, the Seventh-day Adventists. And I'm going to continue with the same quotation in PK 188. She says, at that time, the gold will be separated from the dross. Now, how do... How do we separate gold from the dross? What do we have to do? Add some heat. Yes, we have to purify by fire of affliction and persecution. Right now, in this land of relative peace and prosperity, we can all profess to love God and profess to keep the Seventh-day Sabbath. We can all appear as good Seventh-day Adventist Christians. We teach, we work for the Lord, we share the gospel. But profession is different from what is really in our heart. I'm going to continue with the same quotation from Prophets and Kings 188. I'm going to quote, Many a star that we have admired for its brilliance will then go out in darkness. Those who have assumed the ornaments of the sanctuary but are not clothed with Christ's righteousness will then appear in the shame of their own wicked, own nakedness. See, when the test comes, there's going to be a lot of pressure put on us. We're going to lose all earthly support. We're going to be losing jobs and homes. We might not even receive pensions anymore, social security. We might lose health care, electricity, food, and water. And on top of that, that's bad enough. On top of that, and th that pressure, the, the physical pressure, I mean, that's bad enough, but then there's a psychological attack, war against us. See, just like now, the terrorists are really hated and feared by the world, right? The Seventh-day Adventists or Sabbath keepers are going to be 
like the terrorists. We're going to be hated. People are going to be angry at us. Not only from the public, the media. But when the pressure comes from our own friends, our family members, our neighbors, that's really going to be a big pressure. So are we going to show our love for Jesus by continuing to keep the Sabbath holy when we face derision or insult, hatred, threat of imprisonment, or even death? So the real issue is not necessarily which day. It is important to know which day, yes. But the question is, who do you know and trust? and love the most. Is it Jesus or is it ourselves? So it's easy to say we love Jesus. But how, you know, it's another thing to show that love by obeying his commandment. And the key was in the statement that I just shared with you from PK 188. Okay? We need to be clothed with Christ's righteousness. Either that, either we're covered in Christ's righteousness, or we're going to be in our own nakedness, one or the other. Remember when Adam and Eve first sinned in Genesis chapter 3? See, they lost that robe of light and they were naked. And yet, God is so good. He came to their rescue. He called them. He came and gave a chance to repent, to confess, and, and be forgiven. And God gave them coats of skin to cover them instead of the fig apron. And that represents the sacrifice of Jesus. His garment of righteousness. And we're told that, you know, Adam lived 930 years altogether. And we're told that his life was a life of continual repentance, continually depending on God. We're told that in the book, Story of Redemption, page 55, if you like to read about that. See, when we sin, are we clothed or are we naked? We're naked. We're naked. So we need to go and repent and confess and be forgiven. And then we're clothed again with the robe of righteousness, right? Yes. But it has to be a continual repentance, continual prayer for mercy and grace. Because it's not something we do once at baptism. Okay, I was baptized. I'm covered for the rest of my life. No, it's not something we do once a week either. When we come to church, I'm covered now for the rest of the week. And it's not even something like we do once a day in the morning. Yes, we are covered when we confess and repent and be forgiven. But then I leave that place and then I go on and by the end of the day, I realize, uh-oh, I'm naked again. Where did I lose my garment? And I remember the day, oh yes, yes, I did this, and then I lost my patience, and then this and this. Lord, forgive me. So it's something that has to go on continually, continually. And as we grow, we're going to learn. When we first feel this inkling, you know, sometimes we feel this impatience arising or anger, Instead of allowing him to control me, I go first to Jesus. Lord, I have this pride. I have this problem in me. Help me. Cover me. And then he does. Now, the feeling might stay. I'm warning you, the feeling might stay. You might still feel angry. But by faith, we ask the Lord, please cover me with your garment. And then and only then we can remain silent. I don't have to express my impatience or anger. And then eventually the feeling goes away. And then there's joy and rest in my soul. 
And that's the growth. We, we're going to learn how to keep on the garment longer and longer. Okay? So that's the key. Do we have his robe or not? And we have to have the sense of our own weakness and total dependence on the Lord Jesus. That's where the key is. That's what Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, right? Are we poor and naked and blind? Then we have much hope because then we have that continual um, sense of our need for his righteousness. I really like the way um, Christ's object lesson describes. It's 312, page 312 of Christ's object lesson. In fact, you need to read the whole chapter. It's on without the waiting garment. It's all about this garment of righteousness. We're told that when we submit ourselves to Christ, the heart is united with his heart. The will is merged in his will. The mind becomes one with his mind. And the thoughts are brought into captivity to him. We live his life. And this is what it means to be clothed in the garment of his righteousness. So that's the kind of experience we need to have now. And that's the most important preparation for Sunday law. Because it's either you have his garment on or you don't. And we need to practice keeping that on every day, every single moment. So we might know intellectually, seventh day is a Sabbath. But if he don't have his robe, yeah, then we are not going to be victorious in that test. Worship the lamb on the Sabbath or worship the beast on Sunday. That's the test. But that's the tip of the iceberg. Underneath is our character. Either we're going to be like the lamb, Jesus Christ, or are we going to be like the beast, Satan? One or the other. So the test is for every single soul living on this earth, including ourselves. Now we go on to the second misconception, and this is kind of a big one because it affects the, all the other uh, understanding. So is Sunday law a brief one-time event? Now let's go back to the Bible. Okay, we were in Revelation 13, right? And now we're going to look at verses 16 and 17. Revelation 13, 16 and 17. It says, he, he meaning the image of the beast. The image of the beast is already formed by this time. The Sunday law is, has been established. It says, verse 16, and he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Okay? There will be an economic sanction against those who refuse to worship the mark of the beast, Sunday worship. But then this pressure is going to increase more and more. Because if you look at verse 15, the last part of the verse 15, where it says the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as will not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Speaking of the nation. In other words, legislative and judicial authorities are going to make and enforce the Sunday law with a penalty of death. Okay, so there will be a progression. So the answer is no, the Sunday law is not a brief one-time event where it says comes and then goes. No, it takes time. It's a process. It's going to be a period of time. We don't know how long. The Bible doesn't give us how long. But it's going to be a process. Now I'm going to refer you back to the book Great Controversy. 574 through 
578. Great Controversy 574 to 578. Where she talks about the first Sunday law that was established back in 321 AD. Okay. During the time of uh, pagan Rome where Constantine established the Sunday law. At that time, if you read those pages, people were allowed to keep both Sabbath and Sunday for a while. And then they were told to rest on Sunday. And then later, they had to work on Sabbath. So there was a progression, getting more and more severe. And then we're told on page 578, scenes from the records of the past are to be repeated. What happened in the past will be repeated again. So at first, when the Sunday law comes in our day, we're told to rest on Sunday. And then we'll be forced to worship on Sunday while being allowed to keep the Sabbath at the same time. Okay? We have to be careful with that. See, Sunday law is not going to be so straightforward as some might be, uh, be thinking. It's not going to be black and white. It's not going to be as simple as we think. It's going to be a little bit more confusing and a little bit more fuzzy. See, we're told, this is from Testimonies for the Church, Volume 9, 233. We're told that it's okay to have religious services for those who don't know the truth on Sunday. Okay? Hold religious services for those who don't know the truth. In other words, evangelistic meeting is okay to have on Sunday, or Monday, or Tuesday, right? Any day. But what is that different from true worship on the Sabbath? Evangelist or, or missionary work is okay on Sunday, but not worship. So we have to really understand the purpose. What is the motive of those religious services? We really need to understand for ourselves. And the final step will be, we'll be forced to work on Sabbath under much pressure. So the text is not going to be easy because there'll be voices coming from other churches, other um, organizations. Wow, if we love Jesus, we're in the same group. You have the same God. You believe in the same Bible. Let's get together. Come on. The cause will come. Wow, why are you so, um, you know, hanging on to your Sabbath? You're so legalistic. We're saved by faith, not by keeping the Sabbath. In fact, are all ministers in our Seventh-day Adventist church our own ministers will urge the necessity of keeping Sunday. Did you know that? Our own ministers are going to advocate Sunday worship. You can read about that from Review and Herald, March 18, 1884. There's going to be a lot of pressure, not only from the outside, from inside. And we have to really understand what is true worship. Who are we going to follow? See, the Sunday law test is a process we call shaking. We call it shaking. It's going to get more and more severe. And whoever is not really standing on the truth will be shaking out of that truth. Not necessarily out of the church. We might be in the church. We might be still in the group worshiping but we're going to be shaking out of the truth. See, God is looking for true soldiers for the last battle. And the only condition are we covered with the righteousness of Jesus. And if you can 
uh, recall Gideon's army in the book Judges, chapter 7. At first, there were about 32,000 soldiers. And then after the first test, it went down to 10,000. And another test, and then came down to only 300. God is not looking for big numbers. God is looking for those who truly, truly love Jesus and want to obey him all the way. So if you can imagine this testing process like a quiz program. At first, there are many contestants. The Bible uh, says that the judgment begins with the house of God, right? That's from 1 Peter 4.17. So the first contestants on this quiz program are all Seventh-day Adventists. The first questions are easy ones. No, no problem. Yes, yes, yes. But then the questions become more and more difficult. And some of the contestants are going to drop out. And then new contestants come in to replace the vacancies. And that's how Ellen White describes in this vision about this shaking process. You can read about that from early writings, 269 through 271, where she sees a vision of soldiers marching, a company of soldiers marching. But among the soldiers, there are many who are careless and indifferent. And they drop out. But their places are immediately filled by others taking hold of the truth. And they march on. And this process, as pressure increases, at the end, God is going to end up with two classes of people, two groups, commandment keepers and commandment breakers. And until the entire process is finished, we don't know the outcome of the test. See, remember what Jesus said. Remember Lot's wife. See, Lot's wife, her body was out of the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. Wasn't she out of it? She ran out. But her heart was still in Sodom. That's why she turned back, even though God said, don't turn back. And she turned into a pillar of salt. So until last minute, we don't know. We might be, you know, we might appear to be keeping the Sabbath. Only God knows the heart. So until the entire process is finished, we don't know until last minute. So we need to really ask ourselves, our bodies might be <clears throat> here on Sabbath worshiping God, but where are our hearts? And so, the Sunday law is not a simple one-time event. It's going to continue for a while. So the third misconception, so does probation close for Seventh-day Adventists at Sunday law when it's first enacted? And the answer we know is no already because it's not just brief one-time event. It's going to continue for a while until the whole process is finished. No, the provision does not close. I'm going to share uh, one quotation from 7 BC, Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 976. I'm going to quote, The Lord has shown me clearly that the image of the beast will be formed before provision closes, for it is to be the great test for the people of God, by which their eternal destiny will be decided. And she quotes from Revelation 13, verses 11 through 17. So provision does not close at Sunday law when it's first enacted. It has to take its course. Okay? At the end, we will have the provision closed. And we're going to talk more about it when we study about the close of provision later on during the year. There's only one close of provision for all people, including the Seventh-day Adventists. There was only one close of provision in Noah's day 
when the door of the ark shut. There was only one clause of provision in Lot's day when fire and brimstone rained on Sodom. But something else closes for Seventh-day Adventist at Sunday law. Do you know what it is? It's the close of preparation period. Because at that time, we need to be prepared to go out and give the loud cry message for others. You know, many people, I know some of them personally, they're preparing for the Sunday law, but they're so focused on self-preservation. They're into wilderness survival skills. They take courses. They're, some of them are trying to practice hiking up the mountain. I mean, it doesn't hurt to have those knowledge about wilderness survival or being physically fit. It doesn't hurt, but our focus is not on self-preservation. The reason why God wants us to be alive and well during this time is so that we can help others. It's for others' sake that we need to be in good condition to be prepared to give the last message so others can come to know the truth. So the focus should be, are we ready to share the three angels' message from the Bible? Are we covered with the robe of righteousness? Are we having experience so we can explain, we can teach other people how they can be covered? also with this raiment. <coughs> so with that, the, the last misconception, our Seventh-day Adventists sealed in their forehead at Sunday Law when it's first enacted? No, the answer is the same. It's not just one-time event. We have to go through the test. After the test, we're sealed. 7 BC, same quotation as the last one, 976. 7 BC, 976. It says, this is the test that the people of God must have before they are sealed. Those who yield the truth of heavenly origin and accept the Sunday Sabbath will receive the mark of the beast. Yes, so the answer is no. We are sealed after the Sunday law testing process is completed for every single person. We don't get grades at the beginning of the final exam or the middle of final exam, right? It's only after we finish taking the final exam we get the grades. And the grade will be either pass or fail. Either we receive the seal of God or mark of the beast. No in between. Now, by this time, you might be asking, why is Sunday law so important? As I mentioned earlier, it's an event that marks the beginning of all the other events that occurred during the same period. And this period we call the little time of trouble. From Sunday law, okay, we start the latter rain, the loud cry, the judgment of the living, and then when that time is finished, when the test is completed, we have the seal of God, close of provision, the sins are blotted out. The character is perfected. We have the 144,000 emerge as a result. And then after that, great time of trouble begins when the last plagues will begin to fall. There will be no intercessor. And then the second coming. If we teach and believe that we are sealed and that our provision closes at Sunday law when it's first enacted, what difference would that, makes, that make if, if we believe that way? Okay, if we believe that we're sealed and that our provision is already closed at Sunday law when it first comes up, 
then we should be perfect during the Lao Kari period. We should be all perfect. But the truth is, during that period, when the ladder, in, ladder rain is falling, that the ladder rain is going to ripen the fruit, ripen our character. It's a finishing touch. We're not perfect yet. And yet people believing, oh, I'm perfect now. And what if that person sees imperfection in others? Oh, you're still doing that? Your provision is supposed to close already. Oh, oh you're not going to be saved. We're going to be judging others. Or if I see my own imperfection in me, oh no, that means I'm not going to make it. I might as well join the crowd and keep Sunday then if I'm not going to make it. Do you see the danger? If we believe in errors, there's so much danger to be deceived during that period. How long? We don't know. There are many people who believe in futurism. They set the time from Sunday law until this, three and a half years or whatever. No, that's not the truth. We're not told how long. That's why it's a test. If you knew, you just count the, and mark the calendar, right? Oh, this many more months, this many more weeks. It's not going to be a real test. We don't know how long. That's why we're going to be crying day and night. There's going to be delays. That's when the real test, where faith will be tested to the extreme. That's why we need the robe of righteousness. Without that, we'll never make it. Okay, let's put this all together in the last um, part of this message. Okay, we know that the beast with two horns like a lamb, the United States, will do all the speaking, all the actions. Okay, but who is behind that power? We know from Revelation 13, verse 12. Let's go back to our Bible. Revelation 13 and verse 12. Okay, who's behind this power? It says, verse 12 says, And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him. In other words, behind this power, United States power is Rome, the first beast, which is papacy. That's why in the book Great Controversy, 581, 581, I'm going to quote, it says, she, who is this she? Church. Church, it's Rome, yes. Rome. She's talking about this papacy, church, Rome. She is silently growing into power. Her doctrines are exerting their influence in legislative halls, in the churches, in the hearts of men. Did you hear that? See, Rome's doctrine, Rome's power, already in the government in the churches and in the hearts of the people. We're being educated silently, unconsciously by the media, by Hollywood or whatever. It's silently growing into power. And I'm going to continue with the same quotation, Great Controversy 581. She, again talking about Rome, she is piling up her lofty and massive structures in the secret recesses of which her former persecutions will be repeated. Do you know what that means? There are already structures and systems in place for imprisonment and torture all over this nation, maybe in other parts of the world. Everything is ready, ready to go. And then I'm going to continue. Same statement. Stealthily, 
and unsuspectedly, she is strengthening her forces to further her own ends when that time shall come for her to strike. Stealthily and unsuspectedly, we don't hear, we don't see it. What we see is just the tip of the iceberg. We get all excited with the movement of the Pope, Pope Francis, but that's just, just the surface. But underneath, her powers are working, working, preparing, preparing. When that time shall come for her to strike, when that time is, we don't know. Any time now, any time. Certain series of events might trigger that. She is ready to strike at any time. And another thing we need to remember is that the people, the public, will demand Sunday law. Great controversy, 592. 592 says, political corruption is destroying love of justice and regard for truth. And even in free America, rulers and legislators, in order to secure public favor, will yield to the popular demand for a law enforcing Sunday observances. It will be the people who will demand the Sunday law. And remember what Jesus said in Luke 21? verses 25 to 26. Upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear. People will be in fear, in perplexity. Fear of natural calamities. They're going to cry out for protection and preservation of lives. What about fear of terrorism and wars? They're going to cry for peace and safety. What about fear of financial collapse? They're going to cry for stability and prosperity. They're going to be a series of events that will bring the people, the public, to a dead end where there's no way out. And in desperation, they're going to cry out for Sunday law to appease angry God. That's what they believe under deception. And with that, let's turn our Bibles to our scripture reading, Revelation 16, as we wrap this up. Revelation 16, verse 15. Where George read for us earlier. Revelation 16 verse 15 says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watches and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. This is called Armageddon message. Why? Because it's right in between that Armageddon. If you look at verse 16, he gathers them together into a place called, in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. Now this thief, coming as a thief, many people believe that that's a second coming, but it's not. It's a close of probation. If you look at the context, the seven plagues are already falling. And if you look at chapter 15, verse 8, just before the seven plagues begin to fall, the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no man was able to enter into the temple. There is no intercessor in the temple. And then the seven plagues begin to fall. So this coming of Jesus as a thief is not the second coming, but it's the close of probation that comes silently. And we're going to talk more about that when we study the close of probation. But this is the last warning that Jesus gave. Do you have your garment or are you naked? Remember the message to Laodicea? We are to have the white raiment. 
so that our shame of our nakedness don't appear. And that's why it's so important that we understand our own weakness, that we are wretched and miserable and poor and blind. But then this message gives us his last assurance. If you go to verse 14 of Revelation 15, um, 15, 16, verse 14, the last part says, to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. This last battle, the battle of Armageddon, is not our battle. The battle of God Almighty. It's God's battle. It's not ours. As long as we're covered with the righteousness of Jesus, we're going to have victory. And the people who have victory are described in chapter 19, verse 8. Revelation 19, verse 8. It says, And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. That they receive from Jesus Christ is the righteousness of saints. So, the Sunday law is not a test to be feared that we need to be afraid of as long as we have the robe of Jesus, righteousness of Jesus. That's why we need to learn to watch and keep that garment. And as a last verse, Revelation 3, verses 3 and 4, as we end this message. Revelation chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. And this is something we need to remember because the Bible says in verse 3, Remember, therefore, remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. And the promise is in verse 5, He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. So we need to hold fast to that which we have received and heard. If we don't hold on, we're going to lose it. So the ultimate test is whether we're going to distrust ourselves and trust in Jesus. Do we have the sense of our own weakness, the sense of our need, and continue repentance. So let's remember this promise. The promise that we can overcome through the merits of Jesus Christ and be with God forever. So let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this message of warning and message of assurance that in Christ we can be overcomers in this coming test, the last test on earth. Lord, help us daily to have an experience in depending on you wholly so that we can be covered with your robe of righteousness. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.